re remember again that there are four steps to the process of designing a nudge. Mapping the context, selecting a nudge, identifying a specific lever to execute the nudge, and finally, the process of designing and iterating through experimentation. We've talked about the first two, and at the end of those two stages, what you've now got is a diagram that represents decision-making over time, as well as a set of nudges that you could potentially implement at each stage. It's now time to think about specific ways in which we can implement those nudging strategies. And what you see here is a list of common levers that we use in implementing some of those nudging strategies. Let's start with a simple lever, automatic processes. Suppose you get people to automatically enroll in organ donation programs or in retirement savings programs. It just removes one step from the process because now they don't need to open accounts. They're already part of the process. So that's a very powerful, simple nudging strategy. Second strategy, defaults. We've talked a lot about defaults in an earlier session. Uh, changing the default changes the way in which people make choices. Defaults are potentially interesting because every decision that we make, be it buying a sandwich, enrolling in this class, choosing to read the book, everything has a default. The default for the nudge book is to not read it. But you've got to do something to go out and get it. The default for a sandwich or a cafeteria experience is to buy the standard meal and then move away. And in many situations, people often waste the default. We don't know where defaults come from. Could we somehow tinker around with the defaults to steer people along that decision path? Framing of information is another big potential nudging strategy. We've talked about the fact that framing information as losses has a much bigger impact than framing the same information as a gain. If you tell people that they should upgrade to energy efficient appliances because they would lose money every month by, by not doing so, versus they would gain by doing so, there's a significant increase in the number of people that enroll. Managing the choice set and presenting it in different ways is yet another common lever. Rather than giving people a, a choice from out of 60 or 100 different funds, if you could somehow group and organize them and lead people through a multiple stage process where they first select a category of funds and then the actual fund itself will ease the decision making process. You could also simplify processes. We've talked about the fact that when we impose any transaction cost through a decision point, that transaction costs tend to inhibit progress towards a particular outcome. So if there's a behavior that you want to restrict you actually want to make the process a bit more complex. If it's a behavior that you want people to accomplish, you want to make the process as simple as possible. Improving decision making through technology, we've spoken about that a lot in this course. Uh, and then finally, another common nudging implementation strategy is the way in which you change the salience of the payment that people often need to make. Think about paying energy bills. If we pay energy bills online, direct debit, people don't notice the economic impact. If on the other hand you make people put five cents on their grocery bill for every single plastic bag they consume, it becomes a salient cost. And here I would make the argument that it is a psychological impact of the five cents and not the economic impact that actually changes behavior. So again, the principle is simple. If you want to highlight the sunk cost effect, if you want to get people to consume something that they have prepaid for, make sure you increase the salience of the payment. If you want people to not pay attention to the sunk cost effect, then in fact you reduce the salience of the sunk cost effect. So what we have here is a list of several strategies that are commonly used to implement some of the nudges that we talked about. Now again, at the end of this process, we've got perhaps a list of three, four, five different nudging interventions, different nudges we could use to smoothen the flow in this decision-making process. How do we decide which ones to prioritize and which ones to execute first? There are four simple principles that we identify. Principle number one, nudges that attack a bottleneck in the upstream part of any decision-making process is generally preferred to one that works downstream. If you improve the flow at the top of the process, it is naturally going to increase the flow throughout the rest of the pipeline. Principle number two, think about nudges that have the highest possible reach. 
think about interventions that deliver the nudge to the most maximum number of people that you possibly can and choose the one where the reach is the highest. Principle number three, pick nudges that are simple and quick to execute. The simpler you make the nudge and the quicker you make it, the more likely are you to see results sooner. And finally, think through the long-term effectiveness of the nudge. Some nudges work really well in the short run, but once you un-nudge people and once you change the context back, then in fact the effectiveness drops off. Pick nudges that have higher longer-term effectiveness than ones that have lower long-term effectiveness. So these are four simple principles and simple criteria that should help you prioritize and select the one that you should go for first. Once you've selected, you now need to go into a phase of designing and iterating. If it's a nudge that involves the manipulation of information, you need to think through how best to communicate that, what's your visual strategy, what is your media strategy. You then need to design an experiment where you can effectively identify the cause and the effect, the fact that your selected nudge actually results in the outcome that you want it to do. Think about different designs that we've looked at. Are you going to use a simple two-condition design? Are you going to use a fully cross design? Or are you going to use a before and after design? And then finally, once you get data back from your experiment, it potentially gives you room to iterate and update your nudge. Perhaps you've done an experiment in which you've tried to pit three nudges against each other to see which one of them creates the biggest impact on the outcome, and at the end of the experiment, you can focus on just one or two uh, and focus on the ones that give you the biggest bang for the buck. Let me end up this module by talking about three mantras for designing nudges and working with a nudging initiative. And I take the liberty of quoting Dick Taylor uh, on the first two. Mantra number one is simple. If you want to make people do something, make sure that something is easy to do and perhaps fun to do. The easier things are, the more likely are people to do them. Mantra number two, you cannot do evidence-based policy or evidence-based business without evidence. It is important to experiment, and not just experiment once, but experiment all the time. Remember we talked about triangulation, the idea that you can collect evidence from different kinds of subject populations, different dependent measures, and different contexts, and if the multiple experiments that you run all converge towards a common conclusion, you now have solid evidence on which you can base either your business practice or policy. To those two mantras of Dick Taylor, we add a third one, which is document your results diligently, simply, and distribute them widely. Unfortunately today, there is no central database where nudgers all over the world can go and look for interventions that other people have done that have worked. If only there were a common database, then in fact it would make it easier for us and that we would not need to reinvent the wheel every single time we wanted to come up with a new nudging intervention.